Okay, I think we'll get started. Um, welcome, everybody. Um, so nice of everyone to join us. I'm Gary Tier from the Forward Assistive Attorneys. I'm going to just um, introduce our panelists and then get out of the way and just give a quick thank you to Bravana for providing the Zoom technical support. Um, some of you may have had trouble locking in. Sorry about that. We'll, we'll get it worked out as the humans going forward. Um, so our three panelists today are Stephanie Jackman from Ballard Spar, Heidi Stalich from U.S. Bank, and Walker White from Oliver. Uh, with that, I'm going to hand it over to Walker, and he's going to get us started. Great. Thank you very much, Gary, and uh, appreciate everybody attending. Um, uh, my name is Walker White. I'm the CEO of Oliver Technology Corporation, and I am very pleased to be have uh, both Heidi Stallo and uh, uh, Stephanie Jackman with us here today to discuss the, how we can conquer the five failure points in uh, collections litigation. Um, as the sponsor, it's unusual, uh, you know, with, uh, again, and many thanks to the forwarders list and to Pravana for all their support, but as the kind of sponsor of the webinar, it's, we're probably the least well-known uh, folks here. So for those who don't know us, uh, all of our transforms legal servicing by enabling parties to collaborate on a product that drives efficiency, creates transparency, and ensures compliance. Our, our offering, called All of Our Collections Litigation Exchange, automates and orchestrates all the repetitive leg legal and regulatory processes to drive more revenue, ensure rigorous compliance, and simplify high volume litigation. I'll touch on that uh, a little bit more, but uh, without further delay, we'd like to just jump into our, um, our program. Uh, today, we're going to uh, talk through uh, really three primary areas. Uh, we're going to start with uh, Stephanie. Stephanie's going to run us through kind of assessing the current situation. We're going to talk a little bit about what, what is expected from the CFPB, how that might have impact on collections. Uh, then I'll lead a discussion with Heidi and Stephanie on the five failure points in collections litigation and potential fixes to that. And finally, we'll, uh, we'll go back to Heidi for kind of an update on how U.S. Bank uh, utilize these technologies and these solutions to navigate through the, the pandemic, uh, as well as the uh, situations that it, it, it created for uh, allowing them to prepare for tomorrow. Uh, and ultimately, we'll do a little question and answer at the end if there are any. Uh, so without further delay, let me hand the uh, floor over to uh, Stephanie Jackman from Ballard's Bar. And uh, Stephanie, the, the floor is yours. Thank you, Walker, and thank you everybody for joining today for what I know will be a, an informative webinar and hopefully uh, give you some, some great insight to the current environment and uh, experiences of, of U.S. Bank and others in trying to manage what we already have and where we're going. So if we can move to the next slide, I'm going to be talking about how we, where we currently are, assessing the current situation and then looking forward. Um, so current trends and impacts. As many of you know, we're experiencing a pandemic. As a result of the pandemic, we have also experienced significant business disruptions. Uh, those disruptions have ranged from prohibitions on some of the activities that we normally do for clients, outbound collection activities, filing of collection lawsuits, seeking garnishment, doing repossession, making outbound calls and communications. Um, over the course of the last eight months, a number of states have put out anywhere from, and if you can see me on camera, I'm doing air quotes, guidance to actual emergency regulations that have the force of law, or allegedly, I know there are, are schools of thought on whether some of those were appropriately enacted and maybe subject to legal challenge. But point being, regulators have had a lot to say and whether the regulators enacted what they wanted to do and what their advice to you was in through an emergency regulation or just by air quote guidance, they're regulators. They're stating their expectations and it's important that we adhere to them. So in our efforts to do that, many of you have probably curtailed a number of these activities, whether because you were actually legally required to or you just decided it might be a best practice given the current state of things, the ambiguity about what the regulator wants or doesn't want, and just as a best practice to get through the, the, the spring and summer timeframes. Um, in some instances, uh, states, regulators were helpful. They said in stopping this, we're going to um, toll the time of statute of limitations. For instance, if a court was um, limiting filings or not allowing e-filings or putting hearings on hold or if certain activities were um, prescribed by regulation or otherwise, they would say there's tolling. That's really helpful, but most of them didn't say that. So there's some uncertainty there that we're going to need to manage in the, in the future, especially if we are seeking to take legal action on debts because this period of time 
depending on the state you're in. Uh, there could be some, I'm not quite sure the right word, I'll, I'll call it ambiguity, and I think that's being kind, as to what the state is and how to calculate it, and you can rest assured that the plaintiff's bar will be well aware and use it to their advantage anytime they can, moving forward and attempting to defeat suits against their, their clients or get leverage in uh, response through a counterclaim for uh, settlement purposes. Uh, there's also been the clients that you're working on behalf of have off and you as well have offered a wide variety of accommodations to consumers, um, extensions, deferrals of payments, interest adjustments, waivers, late fees being waived, other fees being waived, free online payment, no more repossession, even if we could. Lots and lots of the standard activities and, and things you would go about in attempting to collect a debt and attempting to work with a customer. Um, we've seen a lot of effort to delay more heavy-handed tactics that may or may not have even been allowed in order to try to give customers and consumers space to get through the economic challenges. And also, as many of you probably still are, you can certainly see looking at the cameras for the rest of us, you likely migrated to an entirely or almost entirely remote work environment. And there were challenges in doing that. It required, um, hopefully, not a significant investment in getting sufficient technology up to speed to enable your remote workforce and have them logged in. VPN, laptops, cell phones, whatever it may be. You've had to quickly learn how to collaborate in an entirely remote session. Um, I remember in the beginning, you couldn't get Zoom meetings to work. Um, and they were crashing and there weren't enough numbers. And so our vendors and our tech suppliers were having to adjust as well. And it was a lot at once that just hit us as an avalanche and really overnight transformed what our business operations and activities look like. So on the next slide, let's turn to where we go from here, because I think at this point we're, we're a little more stable, at least as in our ability to have our feet under us as an industry, know what the rules are and where we currently are, know if our remote workforces are okay. You know, regulators have been making a lot of announcements about um, a waiving branch licensing requirements and things like that, but we have a lot that is just around the corner. And I think we need to be thinking about it and how we can get out ahead of it now through investments in, in processes, technology, staffing models, collection strategies, whatever it may be that will help us realize operational and compliance efficiency because we're going to have a lot of need for that. We've been talking about for the last 18 months or so since the NPRM came out, the utilization that is being allowed of digital communication technologies, text, email, maybe social media, chat, bots, the world is our oyster, right? In ways to reach our consumers more effectively and without ringing their phone and hopefully through channels they would prefer, but also offering them the ability to have self service, coming online, setting up payment plans through our portal, working maybe if we have AI with that um, system to figure out what the right solution is for them and avoid having to have live conversations if they don't want that. Um, there are many, many questions here. There are many, many unknowns. The rule is not going to answer them. The Bureau is not going to give the guidance that we need. So we're going to be needing to think about ways to explore the usage of those um, channels, digital channels, self-service channels, online channels in a way that is compliant and in a way that makes business sense from an operational perspective if we want to remain competitive and profitable, of course. State issues aren't going anywhere. States are off and running. So that's another thing and another challenge that we've been contending with and that isn't going away in trying to set up systems, mechanisms, and operational uh, portals through which we can manage all the state law variants in collection efforts, collection litigation, all sorts of, of rules and regulations that look very different from one state to another, and a consumer can move from one state to another and result in a completely new legal and compliance um, uh, operative scheme. Um, whenever we're taking the next step on, on, on the account. And you know, going forward, we're going to also, we anticipate see more legislative efforts at the state level to further codify, adjust, expand um, what they're doing to monitor the collection space. First party, third party, maybe even small business. California is a great example with their mini CFPB and the new licensing regime they've imposed. But for many of the listeners on here, I know that, that, that a number of you are in the collections litigation space. So here's a little bit of positive news. I think we're about, and not necessarily positive news for, for Heidi and, and creditors because it could result in more costs to them, but we are about to see, I think, the heyday 
of collection litigation. Now that comes with a cost. You're going to get more attention. You're going to get lots of scrutiny. We're going to have to remember the consent orders of yesteryear with Hannah and Pressler and others. I mean, that's not going away. Meaningful attorney involvement is going to be a concept in the final rule. It's my prediction. But creditors are not going to have a choice but to sue. It's going to be difficult. There's constriction in how long you have to do anything, and then you got to tell customers about it. If the time, if the debt is time barred, there are more controls over ways for consumers to limit how you contact them. You have to do more with less quickly, efficiently, and I think it's also going to result in an uptick in litigation. I know the CFPB doesn't believe it, but I don't see how it's possible to avoid it. So that's good news, but what it means and what we'll spend the rest of the time talking about are things you need to be thinking about to be able, in, in my view, to present yourself as a really great partner going forward to companies like US Bank and other creditors, um, collection agencies that may place with you, things like that. Position yourselves to get a piece of that pie. So Walker, do you wanna do you wanna take us to the next slide? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much, Stephanie. Always appreciate, always love hearing from you and appreciate your input on things. Uh, this section we'd like to actually talk about um, kind of what we see as kind of these uh, you know potential choke points or failure points in the collections litigation process. We'll talk a little bit about what the problems are that we see, what the uh, what potential solutions are. In the course of that, we'll we'll kind of engage with Heidi and and Stephanie on on kind of their thoughts. Uh, but before we jump in there, I, I, we do want to state, you know, why are we here, right? Why is Oliver here and what do we do? Um, so uh, again, our solution is called Collections Litigation Exchange, and it is a collections litigation platform designed specifically for, you know, high volume legal servicing. It consolidates, it orchestrates all of the repetitive regulatory and legal processes. So you can basically drive more revenue, maintain rigorous compliance and, and simplify the kind of high velocity litigation process. Our, our process, or if you will, our product framework is built around kind of three uh, pillars, the Olympic rings you see there, you know, consolidate the data first uh, into a litigation master record, orchestrate and automate, if you will, all of the work associated with, uh, with you know, state uh, laws, rules and procedures that need to be, uh, need to be implemented, and ultimately um, accelerate the litigation process. And we'll We'll talk more about that as we go through here, but the five areas that, you know, from our experience that we see um, as being kind of failures in this process is, is first the data, starting the very, the very heart of this is the information that we're dealing with. Then once we have that information, how do we, you know, how do we manage the process of operating across different platforms? Ultimately, then can we manage the rigorous compliance that is required? And as Stephanie pointed out, you know, additional compliance that may be coming down the pike at us. Uh, third, you know, how can we deal with just getting to scale, right? It's, it's one thing if we have more files to place, but if we can't generate economy of scale from that, you know, there's no point. Uh, and then finally, the, the stalled inventory problem of, of inventory kind of stalling throughout the uh, process and how do we manage that? So I like to, we're just going to break those down real quick and, and kind of give you a, the, our perspective on it. Um, and then we will, uh, we'll get a couple, uh, we'll get some feedback from uh, Heidi and Stephanie as we go through here. So. So starting with the first one, um, really the, the data is fractured. Um, I think that, you know, starting from the creditor, this systems of record they have come in many forms, many different systems. And while standards exist for sharing data, much of that technology was frankly designed decades ago and they're not often flexible enough to deal with the environments we see today. New rules, new requests, hey, I wanna, we've got a pandemic and I wanna insert a letter in some process here along the way. Uh, additionally, due to the number of systems and the handoffs, these processes um, and the, the data being different can raise the risk of inaccurate or incomplete information, either for the creditor deciding of what is a particular account is suit worthy or for the law firm that's, that's uh, going to be taking action on it. And so it seemed to us that, you know, there's, there's a real opportunity to improve in this area to really modernize uh, the data that we're using to satisfy this. So I'll start here with uh, Heidi, just, just a question quickly to you. From a creditor's viewpoint at U.S. Bank, I, w I mean, would you agree with this? Do you, you feel this pain on a, on a regular basis? Yeah, the, the bank systems of record are, are archaic. Um, it takes a lot to change our system. We've been trying to do that. I've been at the bank now about a little over five years. We've been trying to switch our collection recovery system because of that. And it's a big process because of all of the customer impact that we have there. 
but the the systems even our new system is not designed you know it's designed primarily for internal collections and recovery versus an outsourcing strategy and they certainly weren't designed for the dynamic environment we have today such as a pandemic or wanting to pivot and adjust based upon consent orders that come down it impacts our modern functionality that the the archaic systems because we've had to usurp data fields to use it for something else and so it makes it very hard to talk back and forth between our own internal systems, let alone with those that we outsource to. We measuring accurate, you know, Stephanie mentioned the time barred debt strategies. For us internally, that's a problem to, to calculate statute of limitations that, that affects our litigation strategy, you know, and it just kind of snowballs from there. So I, yeah, it's, it's a big problem of the systems of record that we have and we're kind of stuck with. Right. So, and when we, when we think about a fix to this, I think it comes down to kind of three primary areas. First is consolidation, right? There, the, the data, you know, creating a, if you will, a system that allows us to bring that data into a single, if you will, litigation master record <clears throat> that, is, that is visible to all parties. It's not just kind of thrown, thrown over the fence and then thrown back and forth, um, you know, pitched back and forth between two parties, but rather a, a, a way to consolidate that information and share it. Also in that is automation. And here I'm talking about automation of, of just using modern technology to, man, to manage data, to do the things that we historically have maybe done with you know, older technology, but from loading data, transforming data, cleansing data, even redaction of documents that we want to share with uh, various parties, all of that can be automated through uh, you know, modern technology. And the last is just the accessibility aspect of it, which is, you know, with proper permissions, we want to be able to share the data, the same data, with all the interested parties, and thereby thereby making it just more functional to other folks. So, so Stephanie, kind of from from a law firm perspective, you know, from your perspective, if this is the case. You know, why is it important that the the you know to have this kind of clean clean current data once you know these folks are receiving these this information from them? I mean, everything stems from having clean, crisp, usable data. First and foremost, no one wants to be collecting against consumers for amounts or debts that they don't know or that are inaccurate. So first and foremost, that's what we're all working to do is to, to, to resolve valid and legitimate debts. And so if the data isn't reliable, if the data isn't clear, if the data isn't accessible in a way that makes sense, that can lead to errors in that process. Also, Data problems, data dis, dis, um, data uh, disaggregation, disparate systems, um, failure to upload and reconcile and audit your data, that leads to consent orders, big consent orders. Just think back to when the CFPB first came up. And, and these are consent orders that impacted the entire chain of the business relationship, from the creditor all the way down to the collection law firm, because the data problems infect the entire chain and they expose everyone to potentially millions of dollars in penalties. Also, it just hurts, right? Even if you don't you know, if you're not held accountable for these problems, you catch them, you fix them, it's still, it's a risk. It, it can under, if, if it does come out, it can result in bad PR. If it doesn't come out, but it's known kind of in industry circles, it can damage your reputation. It certainly can damage credibility with your, your clients and your um, service provider partners. It, it's essential that you have good data management, good data reconciliation. And because we're only getting more and more data, it's being required by law, it's being required by regulation, it's just being generated by a pure function of the world that we currently live in and the way that we originate and service debt. You've right. got to have efficient solutions to manage this. You've got to be able to you know, cut, paste, parcel your data in multiple different ways. Like Heidi said, who could have seen what was coming this year coming? But before this year, I saw many instances where clients, okay, I have to now do this or I have to track that. And their systems were often kind of an amalgamation of homegrown um, bolt-ons, just trying to, to fix whatever problem du jour was, and it resulted in a system that they didn't have the knowledge on how to overhaul, that didn't have the capacity to do it, and ultimately it cost them money. It either cost them money with clients, cost them money with regulators, or cost them money with having to invest in overhauling the entire technological chain, and there is not gonna be any getting away going forward from the need to have systems that can be responsive to tracking 
across accounts and within accounts in multiple and at this point even unseeable ways. Data functionality, data utility, and the ability of your, you as an organization to manipulate that data into different configurations, reports, et cetera. Honestly, I, I, not to sound dramatic, but I think we've only just started scratching the service surface of what we need to be doing there. Great, great. So the second area, the second failure that we've seen is really around the, uh, uh, op the di disparate platforms on which we operate. Uh, you know, historically, a lot of data, a lot of systems involved, files being tossed back and forth from law firms, operated in local matter management systems, code sent back and forth, and so on. Matter-specific communication, however, if, is often <clears throat> relegated to, you know, an email, a text, a phone call from the attorney, the creditor. And, and given our current technology, where we are today, and that we all operate on, whether it's Amazon, LinkedIn, or whatever it might be, this is fairly inefficient. It also creates potential compliance risk between creditors and law firms as they update matters after the fact. So anytime there is no master record or single source of truth, you're leaking value and efficiency from the process. So again, I'll start with you, Heidi. Do you see specific examples of this from the creditor's perspective, you know, operating with, you know, the various law firms that you operate with? Yeah, we, you know, the, the, one of the problems is, is that inbox communication. You're relying on somebody being on top of their email, checking it. It depends on what was going on that day, whether or not they even saw the email come in. So the lag time and the response, let alone trying to get back and track all of the follow-ups that might have happened or different people responding, I think it makes it really hard um, to, to manage that. And then it slows down communications, which can affect settlements. It affects need for information. It, it affects court appearances and the litigation. Um, the other piece that we've had from the creditor side historically uh, you know, in, in this is lack of knowing that there was an answer and or counterclaim on a file. So we've had exposure because uh, we didn't know a counterclaim was filed. And so we weren't represented. And so I think all of those things in the disparate platforms, if, if it doesn't automatically get back to us, it, it causes a lot of problems. Great. So again, from, from our perspective, the fix this is threefold, right? It's collaborations, orchestrations, visibility. Collaboration is, is, as we all know, right, a single place that holds all the litigation master record that's accessible to all the parties that are involved, right? So it's, it's the creditor, it's the law firm, potentially the service uh, process server, other data providers that might be doing scrubs and so on, bringing that information uh, into a single, uh, a single pane of glass, if you will. Orchestration, on the other hand, is really effectively automating the many handoffs, approvals, reviews that accelerate the process. And, and in that process, capturing a standardized audit of the who, what, and when of each of those transfers. And ultimately, you know, visibility, which is to provide end-to-end -end visibility for the creditor to be able to look through that entire channel <clears throat> and, and understand actually the position of a file. Um, and, and conversely for, uh, rather than the firms having to report back every step along the way, but just their work being visible. So Heidi, I actually I'll come back to you on this one. You know, what do you think the biggest benefit is of this capability of if, you know, we can, we don't have to operate on disparate platforms as it relates to the creditor? Yeah, and using this platform, the bank, the, tr the transparency of the matter data, being sure to Stephanie's point on, on being able to rely on it um, and, and fix it where we need it, knowing where a file is and, and uh, the status of litigation, overall compliance, whether it's legal compliance, um, civil process compliance, our SLA compliance, and then, of course, we're all in this for recovery and revenue, you know, and, and also managing performance. Um, so I think knowing what is happening or, or not happening, that transparency is the biggest thing. It's a double-edged sword because the other thing we've learned is now we know today what's going wrong or something that, 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 that's happening. And um, my preference is to know today instead of knowing in 30 or 60 or 90 days when we test an audit to it and it gets back. So I, it gives us a chance to, to fix and learn and pivot. Great. So the, the third area is really in the area of compliance. And I think that, you know, keeping up with all the federal, state, local, and venue-specific laws, rules, and procedure is a huge cost to manage. Um, 
And uh, yeah, I just certainly, uh, Stephanie mentioned this before, you know, creditors and law firms are, you know, staffing to monitor these laws. Uh, and since the formation of the CFPB, you know, the amount of quality control checks and audit requirements, and as, as Stephanie pointed out earlier as well, you know, being able to audit um, attorney meaningful involvement along the process, these, these things aren't going to get less, they're only going to get more. Um, and currently, there's just no easy fix. Either you, you hire more people or you, you slow down the volume. Um, and in the face of what's expected over the next few years, I don't think really either course of action is seems like a good one. So, Stephanie, I know you talked about a little bit of this um, in your kind of intro, but if you were to look at, at the horizon from a compliance standpoint, particularly as it relates to collections litigation over the next, you know, 12, 18 months, what kind of what are your thoughts on what's coming down the road that way? Yeah, like you already said, Walker, I think it's going to be essential to be able to manage um, the volume. So being able to quickly pull reports, being on with with relative frequency, I'm not talking once a quarter, I mean, monitoring how quickly accounts are going from placement to a complaint being filed, uh, the volume of complaints that are being filed a day versus the number of attorneys, for instance, who are on staff and available to review and, and sign. Was there a notary there? The same things that we saw the Bureau looking at a couple of years ago when it first announced this meaningful attorney involvement standard. Just knowing because then you can identify, does anything look sort of out of whack or out of step? Is it suggestive of a potential issue? Con or conversely, could we be doing more? Are we actually going too slow? Are we not as efficient as we need to be? What's going on? Oh, it turns out there's an outage or this or that. There's just ways to use that to get insight, not only to, to managing compliance risk, but also seeing if there are areas you might be able to transition resources um, across different places within your, your operations to be more um, efficient to get more done. Um, managing state laws and requirements. I mean, there's 50 of them. And then there's a couple of uh, cities like DC and New York and Chicago and Yonkers and Buffalo don't have too much, but they all have a couple of little requirements here or there and being able to quickly, systemically, efficiently have confidence that you know about what the, those are that updates get logged into your system and filtered across all of the communications that they need to be, that you can quickly test and audit to ensure they've made it into the final version of whatever letter, email, text, whatever you're going to be sending. Um, just having the ability to more quickly manage, make changes. You know, I know some of you, letter reviews and, and having to make changes to letters can be a really cumbersome and challenging process. Keeping track of what state am I in and what its requirements are. If you're just using some spreadsheet matrix can be difficult. It's always great if you have a system where that can be systemically programmed in and easily changed and updated real time as necessary by your legal and compliance teams. Um, I, I also think that very immediately, you're also going to need to be able to audit and test for the call limit and communication controls that the Bureau is about to put out, you know, seven attempts in seven days and a waiting period. Um, emails and texts not being able to be sent to, uh, again, assuming nothing changes. Um, they can't be sent without consent or to places of employment. And if you determine this is affiliated with a place of employment, how do you filter that across your data? All of this is much better done, both from an efficiency standpoint and just an accuracy perspective, systemically, instead of being something you're trying to capture. And you may have to do this in the short term in a more manual way, but long term, that's not sustainable in my view. Right, right, right. Absolutely. And, and again, here we think the, the fix falls into these three areas of kind of codifying compliance, simplifying audit, and customization. And codifying compliance is you know, with the technologies that exist today, there's absolutely no reason we cannot codify these rules. You think about TurboTax, which has basically codified the, the tax laws, and it makes it very simple for a, uh, you know, someone like me to basically file their taxes. The second thing is along the lines of audit, and I very much agree, uh, Stephanie, that that the if 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 we're entering the heyday, if you will, of, of of collections law firms and collections litigation, that pairing codified compliance with a system that uh, a single system allows for comprehensive audit and makes it much much easier. Each step, the timings of each step are all well known, all well documented, including attorney meaningful involvement. And the last point I think is an important one, of which is around customization, which is to say that. 
Compliance is a framework, but there, there are many paths to maintaining it. And, you know, law firms that are operating need to be able to maintain their ability to practice, if you will, the art of litigation, which allows, you know, with inside a compliance framework to be able to say, no, we're going to do things this way, all within that framework of compliance, but we have a slightly different strategy for achieving the same result. So um, I think all of those things come into play to, to help us uh, address this problem. Um, Heidi, and maybe very specifically, I'll ask you from a creditor perspective, what benefit do you think the bank would get from the codification of all the compliance laws in, into a platform that they were operating their collections litigation through? Yeah, I think the ability to have those state level laws, the civil process built in, regulatory risk appetite, whether ours or the firm's built in, lets us, lets us objectively operate off of that and view our firms, um, their compliance with, with, with all of that, along with our SLAs, versus relying on training paraprofessional staff on every state law and hope they're getting it right, and managing to that, having employee turnover, having to retrain paraprofessional staff to test our firms, along with external reports. Um, you know, I, I think it, it, it would significantly not just simplify the work that we're doing, but make it better. Great, great. Okay, uh, on to failure four. Uh, again, this one is just the litigation life scale. And, you know, I think creditors partner with a lot of firms in a lot of states, and there's a lot of business logic that gets kind of captured by those individual states is, is distributed, and not accessible necessarily to the creditor. And I think it, it ties a lot into what we were just talking about previously. But when a creditor has to integrate in these firms using one platform, using consistent litigation process for at least feeding those files out, all parties can really realize an economy of scale. It's not a one-off for every one of them. Even more, I think the creditors provided, a, if, if they have that, they have this current end-to-end -end visibility um, and control of the process. So, you know, Heidi, again, I'll come to you. What, what pain do you experience from, from having to operate with multiple law firms versus operating with just one of them at any given time? You know, mo managing law firms is, is costly for them and for us. And so when you have a nationwide network that, that you're doing, um, each firm with a different system, trying to go in and to navigate that, making sure your integrations back and forth are, are talking, the regular on-sites that we need to do that, that disrupt both the firm and, 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 and the bank. Um, our SLAs may be the same from firm to firm, but... Um, scaling it is costly for us because each firm is unique and so how they're managing to that and how they implement that is different from firm to firm and from platform to platform. That's right. So again here we see the fix in again three three buckets basically primarily for standardization which is basically allowing the creditors to capture all the data you know during the pre-placement process and then share that data based on the needs of firms and states. So Make sure we got all the data, but you know, state one or jurisdiction one may require A, B, and C, but this one requires A, B, C, and D. And by by consolidating all of that and standardizing it, uh, we bring it forward. And that that touches on the second point of, of consolidation, if you will. But I think the other thing that really helps here is is visibility, which is to provide really a dynamic and comprehensive view for the creditor to be able to see how those files are moving and either to assist the uh, assist the firms in keeping them going uh, or potentially balance them to others that can move those faster. So these are the areas that we see uh, uh, opportunity here. I'm gonna actually skip ahead to the next one before interviewing again, um, uh, just in the interest of time. Um, but the last failure is really one that's, which is just the, the failure of stalled inventory. Um, specifically today, you know, inventory is distributed to firms in these large batches and with limited or no oversight from the creditor of where they're moving across that channel, the inventory become buried or, or potentially underutilized. Each file has so many moving parts and inevitably active files gather a lot of our attention while stalled, you know, potentially higher value files may totally go unnoticed, um, either by the firm or the creditor. Uh, and so Heidi, again, I'll ask you the question, you know, what is the, what, you know, what is the impact of stalled inventory on your business? Um, and do you ever try to, you know, quantify that? So, yeah, you know, I think it's a pretty simple answer on that. Files without contact don't create a recovery. 
So sure. when things aren't moving, you know, we are in a volume, it needs to all go on the train. If something falls off and we don't know, um, you know, we can't change our skip tracing. We can't address finding, you know, um, better assets, um, lack of effort, identifying lack of effort, maybe an employee issue or a, a, a training issue, or it's just someone waiting on information that they've requested. Um, I think all of those things, if, if inventory is stalled, it just simply doesn't bring, bring in the money. Great. Great. And again, from, from our perspective, again, the fix, very straightforward, right? Actionable views. And I think, Heidi, you touched on this before, which is, you know, how do we know if we need to try a different skip trace or something if we can't see that? Uh, the second thing I think that, you know, a solution, a technical solution to this problem brings is what I'll call file granularity, which is not, not, not looking at, looking at a, a batch of placements and looking at them in aggregate, but with transparency that we've discussed and Stephanie mentioned and Heidi mentioned, you know, we can, we can, we can manage files down at the file level rather than the batch level and really understand like, why is this, you know, high dollar um, recovery stalled in skip or whatever the case might be and uh, enable us to do that and do it very easily with technology. And ultimately that, that ties into visibility as we've mentioned uh, several times throughout this, which is just kind of exposing this and providing transparency between all the parties really benefits everybody uh, along the path. So, so anyway, those are kind of our five failure points. Um, and uh, I think that what we'd like to do now in the next you know, five minutes or so is I'm gonna hand the floor over to Heidi and, and let her kind of wrap up uh, for us if you will, by giving you the example from U.S. Bank and, you know, how did they navigate the today, which was this, this uh, you know, last six months of kind of unprecedented time, and, and how did that help them uh, tomorrow? So, Heidi, I'll, I'll turn the floor over to you to, uh, to take us through the last slide here. Yeah, I, I think the, the unique opportunity we had um, unanticipated during this cur current environment in working collaboratively in a platform. So where the creditors are in there and our law firms are in the same platform working and talking on a daily basis. And also having a software company that has the, the agility to pivot today or tomorrow or at least within a week or two um, and, and to work together makes a huge difference. So we were able to um, manage um, stalling our inventory when, when we needed to put a litigation hold like many other creditors did. We also didn't have to stop working. So our firms were able to be able to continue work. It just didn't get sent out. So we're able to do some of those meaningful reviews so that once our litigation hold, when we lifted it, we were ready to get back moving and didn't have a lot of lead up time and months of trying to get inventory back into the market. So it, it created for us um, a, a more planned and balanced approach in handling COVID, as well as we wanted to send out, our bank chose to send out what, what I'll call an outreach letter, but it's just a simple and not a demand, but being, but just saying, hey, we understand our world isn't the, the same today. So to have technology that can say, yeah, we can do that for you and make it happen, made a big difference for us in who we want to be as a bank and as a creditor, understanding, you know, we are collecting debt, but we, we want to understand if you have circumstances that we don't know about. Um, so so to, have been, to be able to build that in as swiftly as you can and not, and, and not have it be something that was going to be three months out or six months out, which is just too late in, in, in the, the current environment. And I think in thinking ahead, um, part of the reason, you know, we, we wanted to, to work with you is that, that there wasn't a platform or a, little, a collaborative platform, but even a platform to me that had the capabilities that, that law firms have. Um, coming from the law firm side, I knew what, what was out there. From a creditor side, we just simply don't have a lot of those solutions. So for us, we wanted to come up with something that was cost effective. We didn't want to have to have a lot of FTEs to support a litigation strategy. We wanted to automate the things that, that a human isn't needed to do and really utilize a human head when you need somebody to make a decision point versus having humans doing a lot of um, sort of the routine work. So for us, um, this solution um, was very cost effective. That proved true during the, the pandemic, I think for both our, our, our firms working in the platform as well as the bank in order to be able to efficiently kind of handle that and be teed up to get get back to work. 
Um, the other thing I'll say is just um, kind of talking again about that, um, like the, the state laws and regulatory compliance, having that built in, um, you know, once we, we learn it and we see that it's working, we can rely on that and the technology. And it, it having things autom automatically sent to us, being able to handle state laws, I don't have to be an expert in 50 states because there's no way that was going to happen anyway. So I think the ability to learn it, see that your, your software program is handling it the way that we want to handle it based on our, you know, our specifications to you. You talk a little bit about customization. You know, we can t tell you where we want to have touch points to handle that. And I think that Oliver's willingness to work with us and adjust, and sometimes where we wanted touch points, I learned two months later, I didn't. And then I can go back to you and say, hey, I wish I didn't have that touch point, and you're able to remove it. It isn't a one-size-fits-all. It, it, it has the ability to kind of ebb and flow as our needs ebb and flow, and as we grow, and as we grow with our firms and become more efficient with them. And I think the last point I'll just make is on strong internal controls for us. It, it's, um, it, it gave us a, a confidence. Um, as many of you know, U.S. Bank had, st had stopped, and then we restarted our litigation. So having all of those controls built in place and being able to work with you on where we might um, be over, need some extra control in order to satisfy our internal partners and be able to audit and, and do that all in a platform and have the transparency you've talked about has just made a huge difference in the strategy. And what it lets us do is sort of take, you know, what was a vendor-client relationship and try to move beyond it and be a... Uh, a partner with our firms in a combined strategy and to right. be able to operate on a level that, that I believe that banks and firms should be operating at. It really shouldn't just be vendor client. You know, it's just not what it is. We need to be, we're all working in one strategy together and this let, let us, lets us get there. Great. Wonderful. Um, so with that, uh, we uh, we're at the end of our content today here. I just want to thank both Stephanie and Heidi for your, uh, for your input. Uh, we did have a couple of questions come in. I, I think we've got a, two more minutes here. Heidi, um, one specific question for you. Um, what made you, what made you, and I think that's the royal you of U.S. Bank, uh, determine that you needed a solution like this? Uh, you know, why, not, why didn't you just implement the way everybody has implemented uh, collections litigation in the past? I think you know, a little bit building off of what I said before is is when I went when we went out to look at what was available in the market and knowing we were wanting to we had an opportunity restarting a program to not do it the same way we'd been doing it. And I was looking for an innovative solution that was the, the bank is huge on agility and, you know, all of um, I don't even know the words <laughs> that, that, you know, that, that they use to you know, we have these journeys where we're trying to get things done today and get them done swiftly and get to market fast. And it felt to me that the collection industry was operating back in the 80s and 90s. And I wanted us, I wanted the bank and our senior leadership wanted to develop solutions that, that were going to take us forward. Um, so, and when I went at, when we went out and surveyed, there just really weren't a lot of solutions out there that had the collaboration and agility that we visioned as being like the next step for this industry. Great, wonderful. Uh, Stephanie, there was a question for you about the CFPB ruling, but uh, that uh, you actually answered that. Uh, they were asking uh, when specifically. Um, and, but there is a question that, and you know, do you anticipate, what do you anticipate to be the focus of the kind of the next legislative efforts uh, beyond what we see now? Or do you have any thoughts on that? I think you'll see collection licensing make a re reappearance in New York State. You'll see California implement theirs. I think you will see states look to expand their oversight into fintech and online lending, and that can have trickle-down impacts. And I think you're going to continue to see a lot with data privacy and, and um, security uh, along the lines of the CCPA, but certainly not limited to that. Great. Wonderful. Good. Well, um, uh, Gary, I think that's what we have time for here today. And uh, again, I want to appreciate uh, thank, many thanks to Forwarders List, uh, to Bravana for uh, giving us a, a, a platform under which to do this. 
and uh, and finally to uh, all obviously to Heidi and Stephanie for your participation and all the attendees. So we uh, very much appreciate your time here today and uh, look forward to uh, look forward to hearing from folks uh, in the future. Thank you. <laughs>